Good evening. Welcome to a special joint meeting of the Ojai City Council and the Building Appeals Board, March the 25th, 2014. Roll call. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Clapp? Present. Council Member Blatz? Here. Council Member Lara? Here. <laughs> Mayor Strobel? Present. And the and Building Appeals Board? Yes. Yeah. Board Member Hansen? Here. Board Member Wyrick? Here. Board Member Hilgers? Here. Board Member Farmer? Here. And Board Member Daddy? Here. Well, there's Tom. Okay, I'll ask Mr. Wyrick. Oh, did we get the Tom Farmers here? Yes, yes we did, didn't yes. we? Yes. Okay. I'll ask Mr. Wyrick to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this is a, a workshop session. And before we, well, I'll give you the title. Ventura County Fire Protection District Ordinance Number 28, Appendix L, pertaining to the building standards for application within the jurisdictional boundaries of the City of Ojai. And before we begin, I'll ask representatives from the fire department to introduce themselves. Yeah, my name is Masuda Ragi. I'm the fire marshal with the fire district. Good evening, Mark Lorenzen, County Fire Chief. I'm Norm Plata. I'm the uh, Division Chief for Venture County Fire and also Ohio's Fire Chief. Okay, thank you. And what did we do with Mr. Clark? Oh, I'm back there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. hey, Norm, Any comments for our like City that? Manager before we, get, we no, begin? No, I think we uh, just turn the floor over to the Fire Chief. Okay. Is the floor mine? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I guess I'll, I'll just start off. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting us up here. Uh, we had previously, your city manager, Rob Clark, had scheduled some meetings. I, I met with a, a number of the city council members and appeals board members. I think it was your mayor who said it would be really nice if we could all get together in one forum so we have a common understanding of what this is and and we were we had three I think separate meetings on that day to try and prevent us from violating the Brown Act so um, thank you I mean that's really the intent of today is for us to get clarification on issues and concerns from the City Council and the Appeals Board and for us to share information with you and ask questions in this forum and setting and so uh, I'll, I'll just start off and then I guess we can uh, field questions or concerns or however you'd That's like good. for it to go. Uh, but, but really why we're here today is every three years the fire district updates our, our fire code. And uh, what we did this past year is Ordinance 28, uh, which was in essence the revisions of the fire code along with append some appendices was uh, the ordinance was adopted by the the Board of Supervisors so that's that's the majority of the document and that when that was adopted it actually took effect for all of the unincorporated areas of the county plus the six cities that we protect and then the other portions that needed to be adopted by the individual cities was really the Appendix L and that's mostly related just to uh, fire protection systems more specifically sprinklers and so that's really what we're here to chat about tonight and I, and I would imagine there's gonna be other conversations as as we met um, it must have been about five weeks ago there was a number of concerns that came up amongst the City Council and the Appeals Board uh, and a lot of the questions are addressed hopefully in your packets that you received uh, but that's what we're really here to do is obviously from our, perspe our perspective is uh, the fire department's very concerned with your community's um, fire and life safety as I'm sure the board and the appeals board is and so we're really coming forward obviously you know our our recommendation is that you adopt appendix L uh, we believe that there's reasonable provisions in there that are um, well thought out and 
reasonable as far as cost goes and the burden uh, that it would place on your community and citizens is weighed against the value it has as far as fire and life safety. And so uh, really that's what we're here to do is work with you guys to have an understanding of what it is that we propose and the impacts. I know there were some concerns on some of um, your local uh, items that you are trying to deal with and address related to granny flats and having people come into compliance and we, we don't want to uh, you know place roadblocks or additional hurdles as we go down that path so that is in in essence what we what we're here to do and so I, I don't really want to capitalize on the time I think it would probably be more valuable if if we in whatever form you'd like have the questions so that we can start addressing what it is um, that we can do either to add clarification or help you understand what it is that we're proposing. And also to know, uh, just so the, the City Council and the Appeals Board and anyone in the audience knows, even though we're, we're a county fire department, we are your city fire department. And so we are here to support you if there are things that you want to do. Um, the policy level decisions are obviously left up to the City Council, but we're here to help you in whatever respects. Uh, you know, if, it, if there is, are some things that belong as a local city ordinance that we can help you develop, that you would like to be more restrictive than the, the current building or, or uh, fire codes, then that's what we're here to do also is help you uh, with those items. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and ask our public speakers to come up and make whatever statement they'd like. And the reason is that the board and the council have probably uh, put forth most of their questions. So uh, these could be things we haven't been considered, we haven't considered. Shalom Joshua. Thank you. Good evening one and all, I'm Shalom Joshua. I live at 1205 North Signal Street, which is in the foothills of North Signal, right where the Shelf Road gate is uh, just a couple hundred feet from me. I have a very down-to-earth concern about fire danger uh, for my immediate neighborhood and for the valley. I've been here when the 85 fire blew through, so I know firsthand how serious it can be. I feel we are in as serious a situation now as we faced prior to the 85 fire. And I think we need to take very down-to-earth steps to maximize the protection of the valley. And what this means to me is that we do on the ground what we can. And what that means is that brush, weeds, all of the things that currently have a 100-foot requirement of being removed, that be expanded, that it be expanded as as much as is reasonable, given that not everyone has property that's going to be, you know, hundreds of feet in length, but even if it isn't, we need to address the danger that exists with the presence of these uh, dried out bushes and, and so on. In my case, I am the last house on the left as you drive up North Signal. The fire department has told me that all that is required for the open property next to me is to have 20 feet uh, weed whacked down. And you know, this is like beyond me. I mean, this, this is like really dangerous stuff that's growing there. Now it's more dangerous than ever. We have pine trees that are just ready to explode. They're totally dried out. And I won't go on and on. I think you get the point. What, what I think we need to do is to really seriously start removing brush that otherwise is left there year after year, and it is the simplest thing to do. A matter of sprinklers and so on is something uh, that you can consider separately, but you can't overlook the importance of this, and that's, that's what I think needs to be seriously considered here tonight. Thank you. Yes. Could you say it? Um, I'd like to ask you a question. You mentioned 100 feet. 30 yards. Um, most of them probably throw, throw a ball that far. 
Um, you were there in 85 observing the conditions. Um, in terms of windblow embers, uh, windblown embers, was that sufficient? 30 yards, is, it should be, is that enough is what I'm asking. My experience in, in 85 is, is that the, the fire creates its own kind of wind right. and you have a lot of turmoil going on in the air. No, I don't think that 30 yards uh, translates to any kind of safety. Mm -hmm. And maybe even if we do everything, we're not going to eliminate the da a danger. Mm -hmm. But we have to minimize the danger. And to me, it's just plain common sense that if you have very combustible vegetation on the ground, somehow we've got to get rid of that before we start doing something else. You know, uh, if, for those embers to fly, they had to originate as some dried vegetation somewhere in the first place. Right. And the more that we are able to remove in, in any uh, reasonable manner, then uh, the safer we're going to be. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Shalom. Madam Mayor? Yes. I have a question for the fire chief. <clears throat> Mr. Joshua mentioned a 20-foot requirement on his property. Could you explain that, please? Um, 20, excuse me. 20-foot uh, beyond my property, the neighboring property, which is... Mr. Joshua, come, come back to the here. mic. So the, on the record here. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want it uh, to be factual and clear. Uh, it's 100 feet for my property and I have a, a, a long piece of property, so it, it does apply. But the property that borders mine on the north is at an odd angle, and all that borders my property is open field. So what I had heard from the fire department was that open field only needed to be cleared from the edge of my north property 20 feet further. Could you please address sure. that? Sure. And, and not having been on the specific property, and you can add clarification to it, our, our requirement is, is that there's 100 foot of defensible space cleared around any structure. And so normally, and, and the, it's interesting, the burden and the beauty of our program is the burden of removing the hazard lies with the property owner. So we don't force property owners to go on somebody else's property and trespass and clear. Instead, it's a responsibility of the neighboring property owner to clear on their property. So and it, it's just, a, my guess is, is that in order to comply with 100 foot defensible space around your structures, your neighbor has, you take it the 80 feet to your fence line and the neighbor takes it the additional 20 feet on theirs. I don't, I don't know if they clear in uh, 20 feet around their entire perimeter or just 20 feet as it's related to your structures. We're talking in this instance uh, about a very odd uh, shape, more like, like something you would find in, in a geometry textbook. Uh, and so it's hard to, to say if it is all, always 100 feet from the house that this property is part of. But in reality, on the ground in the instance of a fire, if you have, and this is what happened in 85, the, the fire came down the, the hills and it, it kept on burning and setting off more embers which flew right onto my deck even. And if that had been cleared, if we had increased the emphasis on clearing, some of that would have been mitigated. Some of that would have been, the danger of it would have been removed. So I'm saying, you know, we all benefit from having, from being smart in the first <coughs> place about how to limit the danger. And this is probably as necessary a time to do that as, uh, as we've had, at, uh, you know, we've had a couple of droughts, but I mean, how, how dangerous does it have to get before we act? And, and this is something that we can reasonably do. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I got, I'm gonna have to ask you about uh, Appendix W, because I'm, I'm, I, uh, that has to do with the uh, uh, fire, excuse me? Uh, I was gonna follow up on that particular point about the 100 feet, and I'll promise to keep it very short if that's okay. That's fine. Um, 
you said about the 100 feet, and there's also discretion, you have discretion beyond the 100 feet. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm looking at part of Ordinance 28 that says clearance of brush, vegetative growth, and combustible material from parcels. All parcels declared a public nuisance shall be cleared entirely of combustible material. If the fire code official determines this is impractical, the provisions of W105 may be used, which is the 100 feet on page 49 of Ordinance 28. Do you, I, it's a discretionary issue, it seems to me. And fortunately, I brought my subject matter expert with me here. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to his concern because yeah, absolutely. On, uh, the, on the on the specific footage issue. There are certain circumstances that could go beyond 100 foot, but those are very special circumstances depending on the type of geometry and the construction and the location. Not necessarily, but the majority of the cases is 100 foot. Okay. We have had some special conditions on some tracks that will build in the county that there were 200 foot cl brush clearance or some other mitigations, but not necessarily on every case. Majority of the cases are 100 foot clearance. I was just trying to respond to his yes. the citizens' Absolutely. direct concerns on the special circumstances of his property. Absolutely. Yeah. Mr. Daddy. Um, thank you very much for coming back. Um, I do appreciate the offer to help us with some ordinances. And what I would like help, because I've heard it so many times, is that because of the climate topography and geography, we can put in special conditions. We can expand ordinances. We can change things within the city. And what I'd like you folks to do is help us uh, with this ordinance expand for the city. I see no reason whatsoever that we have large chunks, two, two and a half acres, of dead eight to ten foot extremely dense native brush uh, right on the roadside on a dead end street that will not allow access up north signal and what I would like to do is I would like you folks to help us and we need a 300 foot clearance not a 100 foot clearance we need a 300 foot clearance from brush there's no reason because OI is different significantly different we're in the foothills we're different than all the rest of the cities and so we need to use some of these special laws that that were allowed and we need to have a much tougher ordinance and so i i would look forward to uh, to working on that and and i've mentioned this a half a dozen times but 1002 signal street um we always see where you have 300 foot flames and we have a 40 foot access road and that's a dead end road. That doesn't go anywhere. You don't get to drive up Shelf Road and escape out the other side and come out Ladera anymore. Th those days are all gone. So you've got a couple of dozen homes up there. And when you get to the end of the road, we have an entire grove of dead pine trees right at Shelf Road. And if that is in the city, uh, I would like to see ordinances that remove that. It serves no purpose. It doesn't protect wildlife. It, it, it really has no purpose whatsoever. And as we get into this climate change, we're losing a huge amount of the pines within our little four and a half square miles. And we need to find a way to get them all out of here while we still can. Thank you. And for clarity, uh, if Mr. Stewart, I see him out there, if you would come up to the podium for a moment, this will probably be really brief. <laughs> but I want to, um, when, when we talk about the city's ordinances, I want to make sure that we get clear on that right now. Mr. Stewart, does the city have uh, separate requirements, rules, regulations for fire, or do we depend solely on uh, the fire district ordinances? Does the city have its own, quote, fire ordinance? No, we rely on the county's ordinance uh, to uh, regulate uh, uh, fire provisions but with that being said there are fire provisions that are incorporated in state code which uh, the city can enforce and and uh, modify for specific items okay so and so if the if the uh, council so directed we could actually enact ordinances to address some of the issues that have been brought forward. If, the, okay. if that was a direction 
the city uh, wanted to move forward. Thank you very much. And the reason I wanted clarification of that is, and you mentioned it in the, the report that you submitted, is that if we, if we have the fire district ordinance and we have a city ordinance, there might be some conflict, some confusion in trying to understand the two. So I want to make very certain that we truly need a city ordinance for special conditions, or could it be addressed through the, the district ordinance? Uh, the Fire Protection District Ordinance 28 that you see before you is already approved by the Board of Supervisors as it is. Now, if we have an ordinance, if we need an ordinance that is specifically for City of Ojai, then it has to be developed separately. It can be incorporated in here. Okay. Only the Appendix L is before you. So you can make, uh, you can ratify Appendix L as it is, or you can deny Appendix L altogether, or you can modify it. And the modification, you can make it less restrictive, but you cannot make it more restrictive without a city ordinance. So that's the, that's the steps that are before you for this particular one. Okay, so just so we're all clear, um, addressing Mr. Joshua's concern, and especially up on Signal, because we know how dry that is up there, then it may be that we should consider a city ordinance specifically for that and councilmember clapp did you have a yeah i wanted to back up to mr joshua's uh concerns and i wanted to to clarify whether there's a mechanism in place right now for mr joshua to deal with the situation he's dealing with an appeal or something of that nature where he can because that is have you been up there no i have to look at it specifically from what he's looking at mm -hmm. i need to go and look at it to be able to address that more he basically abuts the foothills, and he is right next to dead pine trees, and so it is really a hot box for a uh, catastrophe up Just, there. I think, I think we need to kind of explore what exactly we're, we're looking at. I mean, when you talk about uh, brush fire, you're talking about ember intrusion. Embers can travel miles. Certainly. So you know, it, it, the 100 foot isn't, the purpose of it isn't really to prevent ember intrusion. You are going to have ember shower. Uh, the 100 foot is a defensible space for firefighters to be able to get into a safe location where they can protect the structure. You have to kind of look at it a little bit differently. Uh, building codes have changed over the years since 1985. Uh, they are now much more protective of ember intrusion. The vents have changed. The construction of the building has changed. And we do also have, on top of that, we do have a Ready, Set, Go program, which we have had a number of um, uh, programs around the Ojai area that we educated the residents about how to protect their property, getting those combustibles off the, the close to their property, how to get uh, limbing up the trees so you don't have uh, fire carrying over to your structures. There are a variety of programs we have available. And if you really look at our track record, we have done a pretty good job. And over 100 foot has done a great job for us. We haven't lost structures. We had 1985, we did very well. If you compare it to other counties, other jurisdictions, we have done very well in the county. So 100 foot has done its purpose. And there has been studies done around the, count, uh, around the state that 100 foot is perfectly acceptable. Now going beyond 100 foot as you're proposing, it requires a lot of the other issues that you have to consider. There's a CEQA process that's going to be there. Environmental impact is going to be. Mm -hmm. There's going to be huge costs to the residents to cut those brush beyond the 100 foot. And then there will be a justification. Like we said, we have to be a justification into your ordinance as to why you believe over 100 foot is required. And those justifications, they have to have some validity to it. So looking at that, looking at the history is there a history behind it that justifies beyond 100 foot? I'm not so sure at this point. Is there a study done that it will show that you require required to go beyond 100 foot? I'm not so sure right now. But again, those will, if you want to go uh, down on the path of having an ordinance that will address beyond 100 foot, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We're willing to work with you, but I'm just saying there's a lot of work and, and we need to be realistic about what needs to be done to get there. 
It, is a, it requires public uh, hearing, obviously, with the ordinance. It requires justification. It requires a lot of background check. And it's an additional cost to the residents that you have to consider that. Sorry, you have a Real uh, briefly, uh, one sure. more question. You said, you mentioned when you were speaking of programs available. Briefly, could you address what you meant by programs available? Sure. We have a Ready, Set, Go program, for example, right now, that provides a lot of education to the residents as to how to protect their property, how to clean the, e how to, uh, clean the gutters, how to get the combustible off their porch, how to limb up the tree, all those things, how to prepare themselves to be safe as possible when a brush fire comes. And these are all preparing yourself ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's a very very useful program. We have brochures. We have stuff. Uh, we have a lot of information online that residents can access. It gives you a checklist of the things to do to prepare yourself and get yourself ready. So when you do brush fire comes, you are as safe as you can be. Okay. Uh, and included uh, within that, do you have um, do you address eucalyptus trees and their combustibility? Uh, we address the combustibility of some of these other uh, tr uh, brush and all that in our fire hazard reduction program, which is that 100-foot brush clearance. That, that's the part that it addresses what are the vegetation, what are the combustibles, things like that. But uh, the Freddy Set Go is no more to prepare you for an incident. The fire hazard reduction is to provide a safety zone for the firefighters to be able to save structures and operate in a safe manner. Those are the programs that are going to get it. The sprinklers. Uh, the reason Appendix L is to protect fires from within a building. So if you have a fire inside the building because of whatever reason, mm -hmm. the sprinklers put it out so it doesn't get into the brush or saves lives and property. So there are a variety of programs we have available. The reason the whole appendix, the whole ordinance is much thicker than what Appendix L is. Appendix L is only a few pages. The whole ordinance itself has a variety of tools available to do protection. And that's what we rely on only you're looking at very uh, appendix L and it's just one portion of it but we do many many other things and I like I said I believe we have a pretty good track record in this county if you compare our county to a lot of other counties we have done a great great job our firefighters have done a great job saving properties you look at some San Diego you look at some other jurisdictions they have lost a lot of homes over the years and now they're actually doing what we've been doing for many, many years. I'm so, going to interrupt here. Sure. I can see that uh, I think it would probably be a good idea to hold a, uh, a second workshop because I can see there are a lot of questions that maybe are not specific to the Appendix L. And so I think maybe another workshop longer for a public participation would be a good idea. Mayor Pro Tem I Smith. We have not talked for one second about fire sprinklers. How did we get off on this tangent of what your perimeter should be around your house? We're addressing public. Hour? We're I addressing public it. concerns. Did you have another? No, I would just like to give a chance for any other citizens that are here. Thank you. To uh, you know, speak their Craig concerns. Craig Beam. Yes. So is this on a uh, non? Uh, uh, what do you call it? Items that are not on the agenda. So no. Fire protection. Well, we're talking about is fire sprinklers. That's what's on the agenda. No, we're talking. We're talking about the ordinance 28 and Appendix L. Oh, I thought we were just but, talking about Appendix L. But we were responding to um, a citizens' concerns, and I think that's good too. That's Mr. Bean. Too, but it's certainly not on the agenda for tonight. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, members of the uh, of the uh, board, and members of the fire department. As you know, I'm an ex-city attorney. I'm also from San Diego. I lived through the Cedar Fire. The Cedar Fire destroyed over 3,000 homes. A huge percentage of the homes it destroyed were sprinkled, period. My home was not. My home was the only house standing for almost a quarter of a mile in all directions on a ridge line after the Cedar Fire roared through there at speed you could not believe, and at ferocity you could not believe. Why did it survive? It's because I made a study of what you have to do in terms of defensible space and retrofitted the house. And I put my money where my mouth was in terms of protecting my house. We lived in a wildlife canyon. We brushed back, but more than that, I actually modified the structure, put in flanking walls, prevent heat getting out under the eaves, all kinds of other things. It's a matter of bang for the buck. 
This ordinance, if approved, let's assume that it costs fifteen hundred dollars a house uh, because they develop more than the allocated uh, number of square foot. The reality is, given the number of permits that have been issued that would trigger that jurisdiction, it's going to do nothing meaningful in terms of OHI. Should we do more meaningful uh, fire prevention programs and put our money there? Absolutely. I don't see them. To give you an idea what life looks like in my neighborhood, here's some pictures I took this afternoon of my house on Blanche and West Oak. What do I see? I see the need to have serious cutback within the limits of city ordinances here, but I also see all kinds of permits and costs associated with that because our whole neighborhood, you know, and large parts of Ohio are a tinderbox because of oak trees. I love oak trees. I mean, I have my own ecosystem in my backyard. Half the year, those oak trees are tinder dry with leaves. So if I'm going to put my money where my mouth is in terms of retrofitting something or taking care of my property, I have to tell you I'm much more uh, directed towards doing something that's meaningful in, in, in light of what I consider to be the, the real threat, whether it's merely a house fire next door or it's, you know, embers flying and in the cedar fly, fire, literally, you could see whole shingles flying, you know, a mile or two and landing in completely different neighborhoods. It was unbelievable. But my house survived. It survived because I cared and I cared about fire prevention. Here's an article that if the council would like to pass it around, it's a little bit about technology that's going in to figure out, you know, how to deal with these issues. But if the council adopted this ordinance, for the few that would be, let's assume a cost of $1,500 per, per house. Number one, most of our housing stock is mid-50s, and it's mid-50s. We don't really know what the construction issues are going to be associated with doing this. But let's assume that it was $1,500 and we retrofitted over the life of this ordinance half the housing stock, say roughly, what, 3,000 units in, in this city? That's, two, that's over $2 million. You're suggesting that the taxpayer should pick up because you're saying there's bang for the buck. I'm saying perhaps. I certainly would support any efforts by the fire department and the city and, and this group to improve fire safety but I think we have to start with, let's look at the big picture we have associated with it, not in setbacks from the neighbors and, and wilderness fringe areas, but just generally, because as the fire department pointed out, our threat can travel many, many miles. And down to the flats, and of course, as you know, I live in the village in the flats, and we're as much at risk as ever. I don't care to go there again having gone there with the Cedar Fire. But, you know, you. we survived, but we survived because we thought ahead Nobody else did in our neighborhood. And there were hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of homes with sprinklers built, burnt to the ground. Thank okay. you. Could you, you, you said you had Craig. specific measures you took. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one. Yes. Uh, could you just, in, in, in 30 seconds? I re roofed with an extremely lightweight uh, product that was made for older homes uh, that we had the high, highest fire protection rating of anything made. It was extremely fragile. It was extremely expensive to put in. I put in, I put in uh, masonry flanking walls. On both sides, I sealed all the eaves. I took all the vegetation that could be burn anywhere near the house out. I had in back, fortunately, in the Wildlife Canyon, I had a swimming pool. I made sure there was nothing on that side of the house whatsoever that was flammable. Cedar fire. What is he talking uh, about? The mayor of San Diego, touring my neighborhood, oh, been in my house, <laughs> you know, when he got to the neighborhood, called me and said, Craig, your house fire is still standing. And I right? said, yeah. hallelujah. We had eight thousand dollars worth of smoke damage we did a bunch of other things too i had i had actually did a study of what we should do and talked to a lot of people about it thanks and would have appreciated talking to people like our firemen here tonight thank you okay i i think if there's a way to have a uh, a public meeting that addressing the uh, brush and this type of thing we should do that but right now i'm going to bring it back to the the ordinance before us any you mean appendix l well, Ordinance 28 and Appendix L. Okay. We have one other speaker from the public, Bill Miley. Three minutes, Bill. Or less. Okay. Um, I'm Bill Miley. I live on uh, North Signal Street, halfway up Signal Street. I did. And um, so I'd like to ask a couple questions. Um, Currently, we have a form of Amendment L in place that requires 1,000 feet, is it? 
over a thousand feet, then they have to put sprinklers in an older residential <coughs> building. Is that correct? No. Uh, no. That's the R50%, right? And 50%, not more. Oh, okay, and 50%. And the new L would bring it down to 25% for no, old? No, the 25% is for commercial structure. For residential, if the addition is over 1,000 and over 50%, then it will require sprinklers. Otherwise, is, is it that, will not. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that not what we have now? Yes, we do. So why are we talking about... L being different, well, it's not different. Right now, as of January 1st, you don't have that. We had it for many years. Every, this, the, uh, the city has to ratify this every three years in order to, for it to be oh. enforceable. That's okay. why we are back here talking. We've had it before, and we've benefited from it. Yes. Uh, you gave the chart that showed how many structures were retrofitted and new and such. So we need to decide whether we want to continue that. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So it's... Oh, okay. Um, I think the co my calculation on Appendix D, when it looked at the cost of retrofitting a 2,000 square foot house, it was between somewhere um, 250 to 450 cost per square foot, I believe. And I used $4. So that would be about $8,000 if you were going to modify your house 50% or more or 1,000 feet or more. And that doesn't seem to be a big cost if you're making that much of a change. So it sounds good to me to keep it. But I think there's an issue we ought to look at, and that's the granny flat comment that was on page 16. And it says that, you all know that, maybe. It says, the fire district <coughs> will consider granny flats that are unpermitted and separate from, I'm paraphrasing, the main structure as new structures and b would be required to have fire um, sprinklers in the structure before they would be approved. I'd, I'd like to comment just a moment. I noticed um, within the explanation that there are two discussions. One, if there's a garage or a unit attached to, there's one set of conditions. If it is separate, standalone, there's another set of conditions. And I took some of Bill's time. So, um, so I, I see that as an issue that may get in the way of our um, amnesty program. But on the other hand, we don't want structures out there that are dangerous to people that have never been, that weren't uh, permitted to begin with, and are now are being, quote, brought into the grant. So I don't really know how to do this, but it seems to me that we ought to err on the safe side. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think, Thank you, Bill, Bill. Uh, you said page 16. I think it's page 12 of the staff report. I think so. Uh, I'm looking at uh, I just wanted to information from the fire district. Mm -hmm. There were 58 pages in. Yeah, I, I think on their staff report they have it numbered. It was page 12 that you're talking oh, okay. about. That's well, cool. And, and, and the, uh, just to read, I think, yeah. I think this is what you're, you're talking about. Um, uh, uh, the building official may consider them new structures and fire sprinklers could be required under the state building code. If the areas being considered are attached to the existing residential structure, they be considered an addition. That's correct. Is that the is that the correct language that we're you were referring to? Okay. You're right. It says okay. me. Yes. Okay. You're right, Madam Mayor. I have a question for the city attorney, Council Member Cloud. <clears throat> if the city of Ojai chooses not to adopt Measure L, the recommendation of the fire department, not and we proceed, or whatever it's called, <laughs> for the appendix L. Pardon me. And we proceed with an amnesty program that doesn't require retrofitting with sprinkler systems, and one of those amnesty, uh, um, amnesty units burns down to the ground, and it is found that we did not adopt an ordinance that was, or an, or an amendment or whatever, that was so um, highly recommended by the fire department and was adopted by every other municipality in the county. Where does that put us in the liability? I think it's highly speculative that someone could sustain such a such a, uh, a lawsuit the city has um, lots of immunities for regulations um, a policy decision you know to not to adopt it I think is make it, it would be very difficult to successfully you know successfully get damages now I've always always said anybody can sue anybody for anything 
Um, but in terms of the viability of some sort of suit against the city for damages because we didn't pass a more stringent ordinance, I think is terribly um, speculative. But Though they still can sue and that could cost a um, significant amount of money for the city up into six figures, right? Sure. They, they definitely could do that. It right. Would be an interesting, it would be an interesting case. It would be an interesting case. Thank you. If I may add something to that, uh, a detached granny flat, uh, once it's permitted, uh, you're talking about the state requiring sprinklers, not the Appendix L. Mm -hmm. And not requiring it, not requiring sprinklers, now you're being less restrictive than the state. And that's a different issue that I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. Appendix L does not address, does not require sprinklers mm -hmm. in a granny flat that you, is a detached that you are trying to bring it back to permanent. The Appendix L doesn't address that, the state does. If it isn't attached to the structure, then the Appendix L will kick in and we'll look at it if it is more than 1,000 or more than, more than 50%. But if it's a detach, it's the state requirement. So again, uh, for the city attorney, are we allowed to adopt an ordinance that is less, I'm, I know we've gone through this many times, less restrictive than or less has less of a requirement than the state? No, we couldn't. So basically we're saying that a detached single a detached amnesty rental unit has, by state law, has to have sprinklers, correct? If it's to be brought up to code. I'm not and sure, but and I'd, I'd ask Mr. Stewart, because one of the issues with, yeah. with the... With I, the I think we need some clarification, because we're not talking about new construction. We're talking right. about a non-conforming permit. Right, and that's, I was going to say, that's As the, the difference here permit, is... As a non-conforming permit, I know there are cities that do not already. Well. So I don't know, I mean, I, mean I, I know two examples, one of them being Ventura that does not the city of Ventura on a, on a non-conforming permit. I'm sorry, Mr. Stewart. It, that's quite all right. If, if <clears throat> there's really a couple of circumstances, and so maybe I can provide some quick clarification. If we've had a structure that was built as an accessory living area that was built uh, before building codes were implemented, or if uh, were built uh, after building codes were implemented and were built uh, with building permits, those those structures would be, not be subject to the provisions of the state code for fire sprinklers. What we're actually talking about is if a individual uh, built a building, let's say in the last 10 years, without the benefit of permits or inspections, and they were wanting to legalize that now, that type of unit would be subject to the fire sprinkler provisions because under state statute we would have to issue a permit under current code requirements which would require fire sprinkler uh, uh, implementation. Now the addition or in the fire department is actually included uh, uh, converted uh, garages which that's a whole separate issue that right now we're not dealing with with the uh, program but they are interpreting that that would not be subject to a new occupancy requirement it would just fall into the thousand or fifty percent rule which I concur with thousand and fifty percent well, or fifty percent no and and, and, and it, yeah it has to exceed a thousand and the fifty percent both you have to meet both conditions Any comments from Mr. Daddy? Um, when we had our discussion with the chief, very, very, very uh, informing to me. We had 11 units that um, went through the permit process and one came out with sprinklers. Upon pulling that file, and maybe we can all do the math, it's a 1,200 square foot home. It had a 406 square foot garage and they were required to sprinkler the entire thing, which in my opinion on Bald Street, <coughs> within the last three years under this appendix, it neither met the 50% and it neither met the 1,000 square feet, yet this is the one example where they were required to sprinkler the whole thing. So I'm not sure how we got to that point, but the math certainly doesn't add up. And so that, would, that file came out of the city. If you want, I can get the exact calculations for you. 
of how that one particular one came about. But uh, I have the numbers. I don't have it with me, but I can get exactly that for you if yeah. that's what you're interested. That would help, especially for the next workshop. Absolutely. When we look at the 1,050 and it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. and then it's different, everybody's going to need to know how that math is different and why it worked out that way. Absolutely. I'll get that for you. Any other comments from the board or Council Member Lara? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, first of all, I appreciate you guys coming down here. It, it, it is really informative. And I, I mean, I feel honored being in your presence because you guys really are experts. Uh, I don't question the fact that sprinklers do save lives. I mean, you guys demonstrated in these last five times you've been here or four times that sprinklers really do save lives. What I'm, uh, what I'm having a little bit of trouble is, is as a community, it really doesn't impact as many people that don't have sprinklers already. And, and I wonder if we need to do a separate workshop within our community to see how we could fix that because it only seems to be targeting a few, in this case, one out of 11 or 13 applicants. So if we're talking about it having a positive impact, it would be nice to have it impact most of, of the people that live because we're talking about interior. I, and I know it's hard because it comes and then there's money involved in it and then there's, I don't know if you, we could really modify this language and have it be conformed with the other cities because our city is so different than, or is different than other cities in some respect. So I, I, I don't question the fact that sprinklers uh, do save lives. I just I, I question if it's right for this community as it stands right now, as the as the um, fifty percent in thousand square feet. If that's really appropriate for us, so th that's where I'm coming from. Uh, and but I do appreciate you guys going out of your way to answer most of all of our questions actually, and being very clear and concise because it helps me make a better educated decision whether or not I agree with ratifying Appendix L on Ordinance 28. So, appreciate it. Board Member Weirich. Um, I wanted to, uh, just in the few minutes we have left, I just, I want to be clear about something. And I want to commend you for your staff report. It's wonderful. In terms of, we had some questions, you answered them, we can reference it. I mean, it, it really advances the discussion. I appreciate that very much. Uh, it is mentioned on page 12 again, uh, and this gets back to if the city wants to have anything more restrictive than what the VCFD ordinance states. In this case, the city will be the enforcing agency. So that, it seems to imply to me, even though that's just to do with fire sprinklers, I assume that applies to anything more restrictive, that if we choose to uh, do anything more restrictive, we're talking about a split enforcement authority inherently. Is that correct? I, want to be, I, don't, I don't want to have a misconception here. If it's a city ordinance, then it is enforced by the city. Right. And so one of the things that I just wanted to bring up um, is I've been thinking about this whole enforcement issue. And right now people have to go two places. Uh, if we wanted to be more restrictive, we're looking at having split enforcement. There is an option, I noticed in the state code, um, the enabling legislation, where uh, it seems to read that this, the city would have the option to consolidate that enforcement and have uh, reviews of plans, enforcement of the fire code done in-house, even though and it would not be split, that that is an option. Would you agree that is an option? I believe so. If you choose to take uh, the plan review of the fire sprinklers and other issues, it's, I believe you can. And then when it comes to discretion about things like brush and everything like that, it could be something under the jurisdiction of city council priorities and, and policies yeah, uh, in I'm terms not, of... I'm, I'm, I'm no, I don't well, there's, there's a lot of... In the, yeah, throughout the fire code, there's may, could, yes, there's not. discretion all the way through. And the discretion, where that discretion lies... I think is an issue. I just want to bring up that issue as an option for us to consider. Yeah, if I, we are talking about um, wanting to do something more restrictive, there's always some problems, I think, in having split enforcement authority. 
If, um, I, if I may just bring up real quick, uh, what you mentioned about uh, this, isn't, this doesn't have much of an impact to the city, so therefore let's focus on other things. Uh, the way I look at it is that it is a fire protection measure. It's there to be used when you do need it. It's more like a car insurance. You have the car insurance. You may not get an accident for 20 years. But one day, God forbid if you do, you have it there. So it is not so much of it doesn't have an impact. It does when it is. The city, the city of Ojai is very different than other cities. I mean, you have cities that are growing very fast, like you got more park, a lot of construction, so therefore Appendix L gets to be used quite often. City of Ojai is not. But when they do, it's good to have this protection. My suggestion is having this protection and then addressing these other ones that you are concerned with, but not necessarily ignoring this one because it is important. Uh, one of the uh, speakers talked about uh, having all the homes in San Diego burn when there were sprinklers. Sprinklers aren't designed to protect you from brush fire. They're designed to protect you from interior fires. If you have a fire in your kitchen, if you have a fire in the bedroom, that's what they're there for. They're not there for brush fires. So there are two different issues. We can't, we can't just disregard this and say just because those were burned in a brush fire, therefore these are not no good. They're very different. The purpose of it is different. So that's all there. You know, one other comment is that, uh, adding on to what the fire marshals has to say, is that, you know, smoke kills most people. It's not the fire. You know, so if we can stop a fire when it's small and take care of the smoke, you know, no smoke production. And a lot of, th a lot of things that we put in our homes now are made from a lot of synthetic materials. Cyanide gas is one of the things given off in the products of combustion. So we're taking steps to keep that fire small and stop that smoke production that is actually the killer in most fires. Madam Mayor? I yes. I, Ojai is, um, a good portion of Ojai has very narrow lots, very close, the homes are very close together and they were built in the early 1900s, 1910 and 1920. There, a lot of them are your typical two by four construction. The the style of building back then was not looking towards fire protection or safety of adjacent buildings and such. So we have a lot of homes in, in, in our community. They're really tender boxes with a lot of old uh, growth trees, a lot of eucalyptus, a lot of oak trees. And um, so I, I wonder why there's a resistance to adopting Measure L which would, protect, would help protect our community from fires in these homes that have the potential to do great devastation. I don't understand the resistance to this. I understand that it could have a cost, but what cost does the human life have? What, what cost does the baby that you couldn't get to in the bedroom? What cost does your pet have that you love that you couldn't get to in a fire? I think sometimes we get so focused on, oh, this is going to cost me money that we don't look at the big picture, which is the safety of our community and the adjacent properties and the people that live within these homes. I honestly don't understand the resistance to this, and I'm in support of uh, Measure L. Mayor Pro Tem Smith. I agree with you totally. I was never was against Appendix L to begin with. Uh, as far as these other issues, you're right. Sprinklers are for protecting the individual home. Uh, you, using half of this hour to talk about wildfires and the city, the Cedar Fire, which I didn't even know which county it was in, sorry, um, is pointless. We're talking about one small issue, fire sprinklers. And it is not, we don't have to make any decision on tonight. This is a workshop. Okay, yeah. and I do think the experts, who is our fire department, has great sway over it. I have no interest in having our department, our little city, take over expertise in fire and fire protection. I'm sorry, Mr. Warwick, I do not see that as, as an issue. I am very happy we have the services we do, and I want to do everything we can to support our fire department. And, and may I interject Full real stop. quickly? $2,000, $2,000, $3,000, and you lose a family member? I mean, let's get real here. You know, let's get real. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to interject here. 
uh, because we're coming up on the hour that, that we allotted for discussion. The, one of the reasons we had this joint meeting is not so much opposition to the revising Ordinance 28 with its Appendix L. It was that we felt that the community needed to have conversation with the fire district, with the city council, on broad issues. We had, we had adopted um, a habit of simply approving the ordinance every three years with the appendix. And that's, we, we stopped that this year. That's why this conversation is taking place. I think it's beneficial for the city. I think it's beneficial for the uh, citizens. And I think it's beneficial for the fire district. Board Sorry. Member Farmer. Yes, um, I was gonna say, I think one of the reasons that this becomes such a big issue is because of our amnesty. You know, we're getting ready to work on this amnesty and then all of a sudden this fire sprinkler thing came up. So just to answer your question, thanks. Madam Mayor? Yes. Many people have been renting these uh, units that were built without permits for years and years and years and they didn't pay school tax, they didn't pay sewer tax, and they haven't paid property tax and they've been pay then they've been gaining rent from this, which most likely has not been reported to the federal government or the state government. So when they're asked to put two or three thousand dollars into a sprinkler system to make a rental home safe for their inhabitants, I find that completely acceptable. And I don't see any need to have any more meetings, any more workshops. This was the, the, every time we've had this discussion, it has been noticed. And people have had the, the opportunity multiple times to come forward and have this discussion, and they have not shown up. As far as I'm concerned, I don't want to have any more workshops that waste staff time, waste our time. We need to proceed with this, get it taken care of, proceed with our amnesty program, and if somebody has to put in sprinkler systems, so be it. Okay, I'm going to comment here. on that. And that is, um, I agree I actually support Ordinance 28 and the Appendix L, but I see a larger need here. And that is, we, I think we need to have discussion with the experts in the fire district in putting together our second unit. I think we can benefit by that expertise. And I'm very grateful that you've spent your time uh, to come here this evening and answer questions for it. I, I just feel it's a much broader issue than just this Appendix L. Mm -hmm. Yes, just briefly, I wanna make sure that everybody understands <laughs> that the, the real issue is, are we gonna force people to have sprinklers? There's nothing that's prohibiting somebody, regardless of what they do, to put sprinklers in their, in their house, even if they're not doing a remodel. So when you say, how much, what, what do you put on a human life? Well, hey, listen, some people have to take responsibility for themselves, and if they have a situation where they wanna put sprinklers, then they'll put sprinklers. But why do we have to be the ones to tell them that you have to put sprinklers in this situation when it may not be the best thing for that particular property? And I can think of tons of properties in town that you try to retrofit some of these old houses, it's gonna be a nightmare, and it would be required. And I don't see why we have to force this down our citizens' throats. Madam, question. Madam Mayor, this Council is Member because it Clapp? could be rentals. Rentals. That is what we're talking about. Most of this amnesty, amnesty mm -hmm. program that we're discussing is rentals. We're not talking about an individual choosing in the home in which they're going to live that they choose not to put the sprinklers. We're talking about rentals. Madam Mayor, we're talking about rentals that they have been renting now for 5, 10, 20 years without benefit of any permits, without benefit of, guess what? Increasing their real estate taxes. The county knows nothing about them. The city knows nothing about them. So you're right. The, all these issues have not been addressed by these people who have these illegal units. We're trying to <coughs> welcome them to come in to make them legal, but certain things we cannot take away. We cannot take away fire safety. We cannot take away sewage permits. I do not expect Ojai Valley Sanitary to bend over backwards to accommodate these people who've had been getting $1,000 a month for illegal rentals for the last 25 years, and I certainly do not expect the county not to charge them taxes on it. Well, so that that's has nothing to do with sprinkler systems. The issue is that the state law will take care of, and we can't be less restrictive than the state law, with standalone units. We're talking about principally 
and, w and we're not even looking at it for our second dwelling unit in terms of, of garage redos, and that's where this ordinance would come in. I don't look at it as helping anything with regard to rentals. I don't see how it's ever going to help, help anything with rentals. The state law will take care of it if it's considered to be a new dwelling. The state law will take care of it. Appendix L is only going to do it if it's more than 1,000 square feet and 50% more than the, the main house. Well, if we start looking at the conversions, it's not probably even going to make any difference. Okay, our time is up. And I'm going to, uh, I've mentioned it a couple of times, I'm going to mention it again. And that is, I'd like for Mr. Clark to get together because I think that concerns and questions of the community is far broader than this ordinance and uh, Appendix L, and I'd like the benefit of the fire district in conversation. I'd Madam Mayor, it. I think that that's fine, but I do not want to take these gentlemen's time a nut more than one more meeting. We have to make a decision on this and we have to move forward, but to continue to expect these people to come forward time and time again to talk with us is a waste of time. Let me say time. again, aside from Ordinance 28 and Appendix L, I think there are concerns and questions from the community that the fire department could help us with. And we're going to adjourn. Thank you.